Okay. Welcome everybody. We appreciate you joining us today. We will get started momentarily as we are waiting for the room to continue to populate. Welcome everybody. We will get started momentarily. We are just letting the room populate. Please note that this meeting is being recorded. And if you have any questions, please use the Q&A or chat function at the bottom of your screen to ask a question of our moderator or panelists for today's session. We'll get started momentarily. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Margie Levin, and I am the Assistant Regional Director here at ADL Southwest. I would just want to let you know that if you have questions for our speakers or moderators, please enter them in the Q&A area or the chat located at the bottom of your screen. 
Founded in 1913, ADL is a leading anti-hate organization. Our dual part mission is to protect the Jewish people and secure justice and fair treatment for all. ADL's ultimate goal is a world in which no group or individual suffers from bias, discrimination, or hate. ADL is a 501c3 and nonpartisan organization. I wanna thank you for joining us today and it is my pleasure to introduce you to our moderator of today's program, ADL Southwest Regional Director, Mark Tobin. Mark, take it away. Thank you, Margie, and thank you for your work in preparation for today's program. Welcome. Thank you for joining part one of ADL South, South Southwest's three-part series on understanding systemic racism. Today, we're looking at the healthcare industry. Part two will review banking, finance, and housing, while part three explores education. Before I introduce our distinguished panelists, an explanation of our programming goals. By sharing example after example of systemic racism and its impact, we hope to convey a clearer understanding of what systemic racism is and why it must be addressed if our nation is to attain racial equity. This understanding may then inform how you can apply your motivations, time, and talent towards fighting for racial justice. Langston Hughes lyrically addressed generational Black disappointment in his 1951 poem, Parliament, when he asked, what happens to a dream deferred? In part, he wrote, does it dry up like a raisin in the sun? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load, or does it explode? If we are to cease deferring the dreams of people of color, we must address systemic racism and we cannot address what we don't fully understand. To help us, we've been joined by three experts who I have the pleasure to introduce. Dr. Jamila Taylor is the Director of Healthcare Reform and Senior Fellow at the Senior Century Foundation, a Washington DC based think tank founded in 1919. Dr. Taylor leads TCF's work on healthcare reform. She also focuses on the structural barriers to access to healthcare, racial and gender disparities in health outcomes, and the intersections between healthcare and economic justice. Her work has been published in numerous national publications. Dr. Alicia Monroe, MD, serves as the Provost and Senior Vice President for Academic and Faculty Affairs at Baylor College of Medicine. Her academic interests include curricular development, and faculty development with a focus on physician-patient communication, cross-cultural communication, and mentoring students and faculty. Previously, Dr. Monroe served as the Associate Dean for Diversity and Minority Affairs at the Warren Alpert Medical School of Brown University. Ms. Laura Garcia covers healthcare and insurance at the San Antonio Express News. She's an active member of the San Antonio Association of Hispanic Journalists and has written extensively on issues faced by people of color in the healthcare system, particularly during the pandemic. Before joining the Express News, Ms. Garcia covered healthcare and nonprofits at the Victoria Advocate. Thank you all for joining us. COVID-19's disproportionate impact upon people of color has drawn attention to how systemic racism impacts healthcare. However, the problems that have led to Black Americans living six years less on average than whites started long before this pandemic. Dr. Taylor, how did we get here? Great, thank you, Mark, and thank you to the ADL team for having me today. Um, so it's so important for us to start with the historical foundations of you know, how we arrived here, how we got to the moment where we're seeing black folks dying three times more likely than white people in the context of COVID-19. Um, we see these health disparities mirrored across a number of health issues. I think COVID-19 has only magnified the inequities that we've seen for several decades. 
So these historical foundations are rooted in slavery and subjugation of black indigenous people of color. And again, they have important implications for the differences in medical treatment, as well as racial health disparities we see today. Longstanding research also shows that the prolonged exposure to racism has a wear and tear on black and brown bodies. This leads to premature death, mental health challenges, as well as chronic health Ill illnesses. We also know that structural racism manifests in varying forms. And I know my other colleagues will share some clear examples of this. So if you come away from this panel with anything, it should be that racism, not race, makes black indigenous people of color sick. And uh, Dr. Tabor, if you could just perhaps elaborate um, and explain how out of slavery uh, this racism has continued to impact uh, healthcare and coverage for uh, people of color well over a hundred years since slavery ended. Yes, absolutely. And I, I was definitely gonna, gonna go there. I think for one thing that we have to think about, you know, particularly if we think about the definition of, of systemic racism, um, you know, racism cannot be perpetuated or live on in American society without predominantly white power structures. And those predominantly white power structures perpetuate power imbalances. And so if we look at slavery, we know that, um, you know, this country was built on the backs of Black people. Um, we see the subjugation of Black folks really follow us, you know, from that moment up until now. And so um, in a healthcare context, you know, we tend to always go back to, you know, some examples like the Tuskegee experiments. Um, and that has been raised more recently in the context of access to vaccines, um, and COVID-19, um, you know, it's been raised in the media that um, people of color tend to be more hesitant um, towards accessing the vaccine or obtaining the vaccine um, than other populations. And the Tuskegee um, is an example that, you know, those in the public health space like to, to go back to. But there are several other examples of that. Um, you know, it was during slavery where we saw the bodies of Black women um, be used for the experimentation and the study of obstetrics and gynecology. And it was through those forced surgeries um, without consent um, that the study of OB, GYNs was able to advance. You know, the study was advanced to the point where um, it was supporting the health and well being of white women. Um, while Black women's bodies were being used and abused in the study of medicine. I think we also see examples in the forced sterilization of both Latino women, Black women, and Native women in this country. And this was both happening in the context of physicians and practitioners, but also the fact that the federal government also had a hand um, in perpetuating those forced sterilizations. And so there are a number of examples that we can sort of go through where we've seen this happen throughout history. If we bring it up to the moment of COVID-19, the simple fact that we're seeing the vast racial disparities that we're seeing is indicative of the systemic inequality that we have in American society. And the fact that African-Americans and Hispanics are more likely to be uninsured even in the advancements that we've seen under the Affordable Care Act, those communities are still least likely to have access to health coverage and in turn, less likely to have access to quality health care. Um, we also know that these communities, because of the issues around economic injustice in these countries, those communities are also more likely to have challenges in paying for health insurance, whether it's premiums or other out-of-packet costs that are associated with um, healthcare access. And so another example that I'll share too is the fact that um, we have a crisis around maternal mortality in this country. Black women are two to three times more likely to die of pregnancy-related causes 
Black women across socioeconomic status. So even Black women with advanced degrees are more likely to die of pregnancy-related outcomes than white women who graduated from high school. Um, and so to me, these are clear examples of how we've sort of seen inequality and racism in the healthcare system sort of follow us from slavery up until um, this modern day. Um, and I'm sure my colleagues will have more examples to share as well. And, and Dr. Monroe, as a medical practitioner, as well as an educator, how do you see the, the types of systemic issues uh, that Dr. Taylor has described? Thank you, Mark. And I also want to appreciate uh, you and the ADL for the invitation today. Uh, with regard to uh, Dr. Taylor has shared a, a rich treasure trove of unfortunate examples of the manifold ways in which structural racism uh, can emerge. And certainly as a, as a physician, I'm a family physician by training um, and I've been actively engaged in uh, medical education and health professions education uh, for over 25 years. So on the journey, um, I have, I have um, caught glimpses, some blatant, some um, more um, uh, indirect, if you will, of certainly as we think about very common examples of systemic racism, uh, women physicians who frankly may be from underrepresented groups in medicine, African-American women, Asian women, Latina, Latinx women, um, uh, who often are mistaken in the hospital setting. They're more likely to be thought of as nurses, even though they have on white coats, name badges, and doctor on their white coat. But there is a, is a, is a mental model within the American mind about who can be or should be a physician. Often that individual is white and often that individual is male. So there's a, 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 a unconscious socialization of who, who should be in a particular role and who can be in a particular role. Uh, uh, Dr. Taylor also highlighted, um, and I just wanna sort of go a little bit deeper. I have seen in my life late diagnosis of breast breath cancer and prostate cancer and African-Americans both due to lack of access, but fr quite frankly, I have seen delays in diagnosis, even for those who are well-educated and well-insured. So there is something about what, uh, what may not transpire within the context of healthcare. Perhaps, it, and it definitely links to the quality of the physician-patient communication. That's why it is so important and it's foundational to the training of all healthcare providers, not just healthcare providers of color, because part of what needs to happen, part of the dynamic potential of a physician-patient interaction is quite frankly, the conveyance of trust. It is certainly possible that trust can be built across racial and cultural differences, but it does require a level of training, readiness, curiosity, and humility among the American, among physicians and other healthcare professionals to connect with people at a personal level. When we walk in the room, we, we should introduce ourselves, ask the patient how they would like to be referred to, and then ask them what matters most to them today and what are the things that they are hoping for as a result of a particular healthcare encounter. That is so important. There's strong evidence. The Institution of Healthcare Improvement, IHI, uh, 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 Mayo Clinic, there are, there's in Stanford, there are researchers that are looking at the power of building trust, community, and physicians and health and healthcare professionals connecting with what matters to patients. When patients are seen, valued, understood, then the opportunity to cultivate that trust and to reduce that barrier to care that may emerge as it relates to differences in race or ethnicity or background. And I, go ahead. I, I just, it, it, as I, what I'm understanding from both you and, and Dr. Taylor is there, there is this distrust, which is generational essentially uh, that is continued in, and the medical industry 
is just sort of coming to grips with understanding how to how to how to uh, deal with that in in order to do better and have better outcomes. But Mark, let, let, let's even let's just bring it into um, everyday interactions between human beings. Most of us are most comfortable with people who look like us, who people who are from our neighborhood, people who share our culture, our background, and our traditions. That is human. That is not necessarily a flaw or a problem. What we fail to recognize, however, is the necessity of that culture, of that curiosity, the humility, and the willingness to connect with a human being as, as person to person. So particularly in the context of healthcare, the, the, the stakes are so high because the trust becomes a key part of the currency. Yes, the physicians and the nurses and the other healthcare professionals must be knowledgeable. Knowledge, cognitive, scientific, and, and treatment competence is necessary but not sufficient. We have to blend with that um, uh, disciplined comp uh, uh, competence. We have to blend with that trust, humility, and genuine positive regard that what I have to offer as a physician, I wanna make it available through a bond of trust with a patient. My job is not to tell patients and people what to do. My job is to help people make informed decisions. And if the communication isn't there, if the trust isn't there, if the partnership isn't there, then the opportunity for us to actively engage in shared decision-making where I honor what is important to the patient but I also realize that we all, we're human. All of us are human. And we often respond out of fear or out of distrust, or I'm afraid to go to the doctor to take care of my diabetes because when my aunt went, when my mother went, when my father went, then they sent them to the hospital and then they died. So there's often a lived reality, if you will. Individuals have their sort of public health approach their understanding of the death sentence associated with certain chronic illnesses. So part of what we have to do as healthcare providers is give people information, give them hope, and let them know that there's things that they can do that are within their power, their agency, where they can make a difference. So is it a, a fair analogy that what you talked about, which is that, that trust from the physician and the patient, it also needs to be created from the you know, healthcare industry overall, which is hospitals, insurance, physicians, you know, treatment facilities, all across the board that needs to be created. And obviously there's many elements about that, but I mean, you're, you're talking about one piece, but it's, it's the whole system of, of delivering healthcare. That's exactly right. It's a, how are institutions, how do they communicate that they are welcoming? Do they have signage on, if they live, if an institution is in a multilingual area, do they have signage that's in multiple languages? Do they have trained interpreters on staff such that if there's an individual who speaks Chinese, if they speak Mandarin, if they uh, uh, speak, uh, uh, if, if they are a Vietnamese, if, if, if they are from uh, East Asia or from Cambodia, uh, wherever they're, wherever they're the majority of the, the sort of, in looking at the demographics of an, of an institution, if they know that they primarily serve three cultural groups and there's a percentage of those individuals from those uh, groups that are not native English speakers, then they actually invest in ensuring that there's adequate interpretation to reduce that linguistic barrier to care. So there are things that institutions can do, how they train their providers, their signage, their, how welcoming they are, that they create space and they don't expect family members to, to be interpreters, that they give individuals the confidentiality and the space to share their story with a trained interpreter rather than having to exclusively, exclusively rely on children, which is totally inappropriate, or other family members to serve as the interpreter. Speaking of stories, Miss um, Garcia, um, that's what you do. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Dr. Taylor, uh, go ahead. 
No, I mean, just one thing, because I, I definitely want to get to Ms. Garcia. Just one thing I wanted to pull out from what Dr. Monroe said, all of the things that she laid out there in terms of the responsibility of providers and the healthcare system would address the issue of, you know, the power imbalances that we see between providers and patients, which essentially is how structural racism or systemic racism manifests in the healthcare system. So I just wanted to pull that out for our participants to, to just take that nugget. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, so Ms. Garcia, as I was saying, so you're, you're a storyteller. Uh, yeah. You've been telling the stories of, of those individuals who have suffered the impact of the, the systemic racism uh, from this healthcare system. Um, yeah, could you absolutely. share some, some of those? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that it's so important the things that Dr. Monroe and Dr. Taylor were saying. Um, Dr. Taylor specifically was talking about that generational, that sort of background, the years and years of, of um, you know, this is just the way it is. So kids grow up not ever seeing the doctor, never going to a dentist. And so that is normal. So when they have kids, you know, that you're only going to go there when something's absolutely wrong. Um, you know, so it, your interactions are, are not the same, you know, and I think that Dr. Monroe's, since she's coming from an academic background, um, I did a story on uh, Latino uh, medical students basically how many Latino doctors are there in the US? And, um, you know, what I found is that there's actually less than there were 20 years ago. There's about less than 6% of uh, doctors right now are Hispanic or Latino, about 5% are black. Um, how do you think that that will affect the interactions that patients in an area like San Antonio where we have close to 70% of our population is Hispanic or Latino, and you, um, we do have, you know, our percentage of doctors, I think is around 22% here, but still think about it. You know, the majority of the doctors that you'll have to interact with, um, like Dr. Monroe said, they, you know, you're not gonna feel 100% comfortable because they don't look like you. They, didn't, they may have not come from your community. They don't speak like you or understand some of your, the background of why you, maybe you hadn't, you know, gone to a doctor in 20 years. And that that's just normal for, you know, your, your, the way you grew up. And, you know, so I think that a lot of, a lot of that's important to know. Um, and I see that in my stories and reporting. And a lot of times I, because I'm from this area and because I've seen it in my own family, I'm more conscious of it when I'm reporting to not come across like I'm judging and, you know, and, and, really tell me your story and, and explain why, you know, certain things are the way they are. And, and I try to write them into my story um, and explain that those systemic things that kind of, the reason why they hadn't been to the doctor for so long, the reason why they, you know, um, may be distrustful. You know, I, I did a story where I was following a medical student and she actually, you know, we were talking about folks who are, you know, more educated you know, they're people of color and they end up having terrible experiences with the system, even if they're in the, their own system, right? And, you know, so this uh, doctor in training, she got incredibly sick for weeks and her doctors kept saying, oh, it's stress, it's stress. You're in medical school, of course, you're stressed. But she knew something was not right. And finally, they, they figured out that she had like a viral meningitis, you know? And at the, when they finally, finally found it, her brain was already swelling, you know, and, and so she still has, um, she still has to deal with, with the effects of that encounter. And, and, you know, and I'm talking to her like, wow, you know, how does that shape how you practice in the future? And, you know, so she, she's going to be listening to people a little bit closer, you know, and she talked about how when she does rotations, she, uh, She'll be with mostly a lot of her colleagues, uh, medical students are white. And if there's somebody who comes in that has like a, you know, Latino name or whatnot, they, they'll try to push that, off, that patient off to her, you know? <laughs> and because they're, they're saying, well, we don't want to use a translating service because they don't actually have them a physical translator there. They're going to call in a phone number and it's an audio thing and it's sort of, 
um, they know that that experience isn't going to be good. So they're saying, well, we know the patient will feel more comfortable with you. But what that does is it robs them of that experience to, to try to have that human connection that Dr. Monroe talked about, you know? And um, so, so that is something that it's so interesting because I never really thought about it. And that's something that I tried to convey in my stories so that people can see that, you know, the, these are, you know, it, not everybody sort of grew up the same way and, and these are gonna shape their experiences with healthcare and, it, and the quality of care that they receive. Thank you. And is there, has there been, you know, any um, one uh, in terms of the uh, patients or uh, people that you have uh, followed, uh, is there anything that you can share in terms of their stories and th that would, would help convey how our current system impacts the healthcare that they receive? Sure. I, I would say that a lot of what I come across is folks who have had just such just not very good interactions with the medical, you know, um, not good healthcare interactions. So, for example, I did a story on LGBTQ plus um, patients, and um, this was a transgender uh, man who he you know, he was in, he needed uh, medication for his transitioning. And he talked about going to see a doctor and it was one of the very few ones that he could get a hold of, that he could pay cash, that, you know, that sort of thing. And one day he went for his appointment and the, the office was closed. Nobody in the office even contacted the patients. He has no idea where his medical files were. You mean and closed he, permanently, not? Yes. <laughs> or maybe they moved and yeah. just never informed him. And so, you know, and uh, it, it's just, I hear these stories and it's, it's like, you know, I mean, that's going to affect, you know, he ended up going, luckily there was a, um, a clinic, a free clinic that he was able to go to and get the medications that he needed. But um, it, you know, I, I see where, where folks are um, having to cross the border to get insulin that they can afford. And it may be that they're that they could get insulin that they could afford here, but it was just they couldn't navigate that system, you know, um, of of trying to get coupons and different providers and insurance, you know, and you just they couldn't play that game, you know, right. they and they didn't have the resources, you know, they couldn't and they didn't have the time to spend, you know, on the phone and or internet access, that sort of thing, and so it was just easier to you know have their uncle go across the border with cash, bring back some insulin. And, um, you know, back to that transgender student, he was saying that a lot of people that he knew were actually getting their transitional drugs basically on the black market huh. here in San Antonio, which is just, it's it's incredible. These are people primarily, you know, of color. And, and I, I think that, you know, I'm talking about folks that are, um, have different gender identities and, and such. But not everybody, you know, just checks a, a clear little box, you know, where, oh, I'm black, I'm Hispanic, I'm, you know, and right. so, I mean, all these different interactions, who knows if it was, you know, bias from, you know, who knows why they may right. have been experiencing those. So one, um, one question that, uh, and, and I think, uh, Dr. Taylor and Dr. Monroe, both, I think both of y'all raised this, which is certainly there are uh, a, a lot of issues that uh, Ms. Garcia was raising and which affect people of color and some of them are related to economic status. Uh, but, but Dr. Monroe and Dr. Taylor also talked about um, health outcomes that uh, are related to people of color regardless of economic status. And so starting with you, Dr. Taylor, if you could elaborate on, on that issue, that um, how uh, people of color have different health outcomes regardless of whether they might have insurance and regardless of what their economic status might be. 
Sure, absolutely. I mean, first off, I'll say that, you know, um, you know, the set of conditions that we know um, that operate outside of, of health traditionally, but impact health, things like access to housing, um, good nutrition, um, you know, having paid leave, you know, having, um, you know, adequate wages um, in your job, you know, all of those things are important um, factors in the context of a person's general health and well-being. Um, but they aren't necessarily protective factors um, for Black folks. And so um, that was basically what I meant in the context of, you know, even when I gave the example of the maternal mortality crisis in this country. Um, you know, for so long, I think in the public health space, researchers um, have often focused on, um, you know, low income Americans, particularly, you know, folks at the intersection of, of being low income or in poverty and people of color, um, you know, we, we sort of, it's been more comfortable to, to sort of focus on, um, you know, some of those other, um, you know, societal challenges as opposed to racism um, and, and how race has been socially constructed. Um, in a way that um, devalues those communities. And so I think it's important to lift that up. There's a lot of conversation about, um, again, you know, these, these issues that we, we call the social determinants of health, uh, but at the same time, recognizing that they aren't protective factors, um, you know, particularly for Black Americans when we think about, um, you know, how, how race um, has been socially constructed in a way to devalue them both in the healthcare system as well as, you know, other broader social systems in this country. Dr. Monroe, any thoughts? Sure, I have uh, three specific examples that um, really speak to, unfortunately, the during uh, negative and, pro off and profound impact of, of structural racism and frankly, unconscious bias and discrimination. Um, and the first is um, one of my patients um, and uh, she's, she's uh, uh, and just so that you all know, she, she passed away in another city, um, but uh, the, the, in a high level sort of uh, uh, preserving of her um, anonymity, but um, uh, African-American woman, lawyer um, in uh, an un, uh, unknown area of the country um, happened to be uh, born with sickle cell disease. Uh, it is an inherited disorder uh, where, wherein the red blood cells, rather than being round and flexible such that they can uh, move through uh, very small blood vessels uh, very, uh, very easily, uh, the individuals with this particular disorder, their red blood cells are in the shape of a crescent moon. And there are times when uh, those red blood cells under times of stress and infection uh, or just dehydration, uh, those red blood cells can become even more sticky and uh, their, their blood flow becomes a little like sludge such that they're very small arteries in their chest and their bones and their vital organs can actually be starved for blood. Just like when people have a heart attack or when they have a stroke and they, you know, heart attack, there's pressure pain. Well, uh, painful crises are quite common uh, for some individuals who have sickle cell disease. And she was one of them. She had lived long past the time that her pediatrician thought she would live. She was in her thirties when I met her and she was uh, hospitalized in a painful crisis. And, um, uh, the, and her pain medicine was not adequate and uh, the provider wouldn't give her any more pain medicine. I thought she was a drug seeker, even though she was hospitalized for a well-known condition that's associated with excruciating bone pain. Um, second example, um, uh, very recent COVID-19, uh, a good friend, she would not in any way uh, uh, have her permission to share. Uh, we've been friends since childhood. Next one neighbor, she called me. Her husband was admitted to a particular hospital in a different area of the country. He was the first 
patient in a suburban hospital, uh, he is African-American as well, uh, with COVID-19. He had a very rocky course. He required, had COVID pneumonia. He had multiple uh, areas of uh, blood clots, common kinds of things, respiratory distress, needed to be on a ventilator, but recovered um, to a degree that he could, the, the tube could be removed, but then he had a relapse. He got pneumonia, he was eating, he got some food down in his lungs, ended up with another pneumonia back on the ventilator. And um, as he was beginning to recover that second time from being ventilated, the doctor told her, well, if he relapses a, sec a third time, I will not put him on the ventilator again. And so she called me and she said, is there some kind of rule or something that says you can't put somebody on a ventilator, they can't be reintubated a third time? And I said, no, there's, there's no such rule. And she said, well, I need your help. Uh, I need to talk to some medical professionals so that I have a better understanding of COVID-19, of the infection, and of the uh, critical care priorities so that I can more effectively advocate for my husband. So I was fortunate, some of the physicians at Baylor were willing to talk with her, do a phone consultation free of charge. Our credit, one of our critical care doctors, uh, as well as one of our infectious disease specialists, not only was she able to get the support of a social worker at the hospital, she got a PDF copy of her husband's medical record, which they were willing and able to review. They did a 30 minute consultation on the phone free of charge with her stepsons. She felt armed and informed. She, and she's a woman of prayer. And so between being equipped with prayer and information, she was able to nav negotiate with this provider for her husband's life. Mm. And she basically said, he's a state trooper. He go, he's been doing this work 30 years. Every day he goes out and we never know if he's gonna come back. He has served this community well. Don't you think his life is worth, if he gets sick again, the treatment that he needs. And at that point, things, uh, the, the tide turned, the trust, the bond, and the care of the good news is he didn't require intubation. But that's a real time, 2020, whose life seems valuable. I don't believe for a moment that that particular physician was being intentionally racist. But there are times when, based on what you look like, people make decisions, unconscious decisions, about how much care you deserve, how much care you may require. And these are human beings. We're all flawed. I'm in no way criticizing the physicians. I'm just acknowledging how systemic racism operates on a daily basis. And, and those stories, I think, do I think capture the impact. Yes. Sorry, go ahead. No, I just wanted to say too, another thing. I mean, I just love bouncing off of Dr. Monroe's brilliance and just also wanted to pull out the fact that all of those examples she laid out, they were based on the color of those people's skin. It wasn't based on how much money they have in their bank account, what degrees they have, you know, any provider that's sort of operating, whether it's unconscious explicit or implicit, it's based on skin color. So even in the context of your original question mark about, um, you know, social determinants of health and like higher education versus, you know, no education um, and some of those issues when it's, we can't wipe away this black skin, right? Like that, that is what um, drives, you know, racism, whether it's systemic or more overt um, form. So just wanted to pull that out. Yeah, absolutely. And and when I've had conversations with with some people, the first thing they say, oh, it's it's just it's you know our health care system just isn't great for people who basically don't have money. It's not about race or or any of those issues. It's you know it's we need to deal with these other issues. And and while that's absolutely true, as I'm sure you're you're well aware, Dr. Taylor. Um, that's just part of it. Uh, but there are issues of, of race that are playing a, a, a very large role. Uh, you know, we've talked about COVID and there have been some questions about this as well. 
Um, and I think it's really playing a role. Obviously, there's been a disproportionate impact in the number of, of people, particularly Black Americans, uh, who have suffered and particularly died of, of COVID. Uh, but now we have these vaccines, and and now um, there is uh, a concern about uh, vaccine hesitancy or um, confidence in the vaccine. And uh, I know that uh, uh, Ms. Garcia, you've written about this, and so let's start with you. And uh, can you first of all, is there a difference between vaccine confidence and vaccine hesitancy? And uh, and what are you seeing in your reporting? So um, one of the doctors might actually be able to explain confidence and hesitancy, um, but from what, what I'm seeing, I can tell you what I'm seeing when I'm out talking to people out on the street about, um, about the vaccine. And this was before it actually had, um, was being distributed, it had been approved, you know, authorized um, for emergency use. And I, I remember just walking up to people on the street and asking, hey, will you take the COVID vaccine when it's available? And I remember walking up to this group of um, women of color and they were also, because of their age, I could see that they they also were at high risk of, um, if they were to get COVID, they would, um, they would definitely get sicker or have a higher chance of, of dying from it. And so I'm, I'm asking, oh, well, are you gonna get it? And the immediate, you know, response was no, no. I mean, I can't, I can't trust what they're going to put in my body in, you know, and I don't know what they're doing with that. And I mean, I, I think that, uh, I think that, that that's, you know, and I, I don't think it's their fault, you know, I, and I think that, that Dr. Taylor, you know, we were talking about this earlier. Um, you have to understand the background and why they're saying this. They have been let down by the healthcare system before. You know, they have good reason not to trust the healthcare system. And, um, you know, and, and to think that they will be used, uh, be experimented on because in our history, in this country that has happened, you know? And so I think that um, that sometimes the way that I write the story and the way that I sort of explain it um, for readers, I, I cannot just say, oh, look at these people that are not wanting to take the vaccine. You know, it, the story is, it's so much more rich than that. You know, there's so, there's more nuance to it. Um, there's, there's a lot of reasons why people are nervous. You know, I talk to doctors, uh, women of color, doctors, physicians that are practicing in San Antonio who said they themselves were nervous about it. Um, and they know the science and they, they can understand all these you know, the medical journals and had been following it, but um, they still, you know, had felt that sort of hesitancy to take it. And among their own family members were trying to convince them, you know, why they should, you know, take the, uh, get the vaccine when it's available to them. So, I mean, and I, I think that, you know, from what I have seen when we're, when we're covering like the vaccine distribution process, we are seeing um, that a lot of the hubs are located on the north side of town, which in San Antonio is more of an affluent, um, wider uh, an area. And, you know, and that's not, that's sort of, I guess we're not surprised by this because if you look at the top tier hospitals and surgery centers and um, medical access, it is also in those areas. You know, there's there are parts of the city that, um, you know, it, it's not, it's, you know, it's just primarily people of color that live there, you know, and so, um, I mean, I'm sure that the, I'm sure that the, the finances have to do with it too, right, like Dr. Taylor, like you were saying, like, but, I mean, it's, it does, it does feel like uh, it does have to do with, with racism. Uh, Dr. Taylor, uh, yeah, anything to add on? I, I saw Dr. Taylor posted uh, an article, so thank you for that. Um, are are the vaccine rates among people of color? It seems like it's getting better as of late. Is that accurate? Yeah, it's getting better. I mean, one thing that I'll, um, you know, I think Ms. Garcia said it clearly, you know, 
you know, I think we need to be careful about not um, recycling the message that, you know, people of color don't want to be vaccinated. There is a little bit of, I think, hesitancy. And I do think it's more around confidence in the vaccine. I mean, you know, some of what I've been hearing from folks and I, you know, dropped a, a paper in the chat that I just published, I think yesterday or the day before yesterday, where I interviewed um, folks to, to get um, their sense on how they were feeling about the vaccine, but also what their experiences have been trying to access the vaccine. Um, and I will tell you, I mean, people, the hesitancy that people have, you know, in terms of my conversations is really around like making sure that it's safe. You know, people are, are you know, sort of taken aback about the fact that, you know, it was um, to them, you know, it was on this fast track to approval by the FDA and the process usually takes much longer. So you have that on top of what we've already talked about in terms of this generational trauma um, that we see in, in our communities around, you know, just, um, you know, distrust of the healthcare system because of that ugly history of devaluing us. Um, so I think we have to center that in the conversations about people of color and the vaccine. And then also too, you know, as Ms. Garcia said, there are real challenges in terms of making sure that it's distributed in an equitable way. Um, some of the people that I've talked to, um, you know, a 90 plus year old woman had to wait in line for hours um, in the cold to get the vaccine um, in no way. She also has both physical um, and speech disabilities. And so there's no way that she should have been waiting in line for hours to access the vaccine. No one to apologize, to, to say, ma'am, I'm sorry that you had to wait this long. Um, that is a challenge for folks. Some people of color who are also living with disabilities, they've also had challenges due to the fact that eligibility is so centered around age, right? So really missing the mark on the fact that there are millions of younger people in this country under the age of 65 who also have chronic medical conditions that cannot yet access the vaccine. Um, in Washington, DC, people are asked to give their ID and an insurance card. Technically, I mean, based on the policies, the laws that have been passed in terms of vaccine access in this country, no one should be paying for the vaccine. It's, it's, it's a public good. You should be able to go in, get your vaccine shot, and then leave. Why are we asking people for their ID or an insurance card? That is a deterrent, particularly for low-income people and people of color who are more likely to not have access to health insurance and not have access to an ID. So some of those things are we need to get rid of because they're and essentially, um, you know, they're creating barriers for folks who are most disproportionately impacted by COVID-19 to access the vaccine in the first place. So I wanna make sure that we're not, we don't continue to recycle this message that you know people of color just don't want the vaccine. And so that's why we have lower rates. It's really about ensuring equity throughout the process. Thank and you, and uh, excellent point, yes. Mark, I just want to just add one point. Um, most, uh, so, much, so many valuable points have already been made. But also in many communities, because again, there is national policy, the vaccine is being paid for, there is no cost for that. There is an opportunity for institutions or communities to charge an administration fee. Some institutions are not doing that, others are. But internet access, broadband access is a huge limitation for a number of individuals in rural communities, and there are a variety of racial and ethnic backgrounds. But when we look at penetration, depending on the state, there are some states that are doing great with the rural communities and not so well with the urban communities. There are some states that are doing better with certain geographic areas, similar to what Ms. Garcia shared with regard to San Antonio, perhaps more vaccine hubs uh, in particular point, uh, parts of town. But the Kaiser Family Foundation actually has some uh, recently updated papers on looking specifically at the prevalence of COVID-19 by race and ethnicity, the number of individuals from each of those groups that have not only had COVID, but have passed away, had mortality, but also uh, vaccine, vaccination rates. 
And there's some very fascinating information. When you look at the percent of population, particularly from African-Americans across the states, their prevalence in the population is less than their uh, infection and mortality rate associated with COVID. And it almost to a state is less than the percent who've been vaccinated. Yes, there may be a little bit of vaccine hesitancy, even if it's 20% or 25%. There are a whole lot of people who want the vaccine who haven't had access to it. Right. So the bigger story is lack of access, lack of equity and access. So depending on what you choose to focus on, to Dr. Taylor's point, we, we sort of lose the more potent, powerful and important storyline and mm. that's equitable access right. and reducing those structural right. barriers. And whether it's transportation, internet access, availability, proximity in your community, uh, whether there is a, a charge for an administration fee. So there may be financial, structural, internet barriers and, uh, to getting the vaccine. And, and just, and I think that like, this has been a pattern that's been repeated for, for decades, which is instead of focusing on resolving the issue, there's a blame element, which this is where the the racism comes in, whether it's intentional or inadvertent, it doesn't really matter. Um, but it is this blame which causes a disparate impact. And we have uh, just seven minutes left. And so I apologize for putting you all through this, what I guess is sort of a lightning round here. But I, I want to look forward. There have been a number of great questions on a number of issues, and I apologize for not being able to, to get through all of these. Um, but that is, you know, what can we do? Uh, some of the questions look at medical schools uh, and look at uh, where, uh, you know, doctors, uh, you know, that are, uh, you know, people of color uh, who are becoming doctors. Uh, there's concern about uh, doctors who are retiring uh, and who will replace them. Um, but ultimately, uh, you know, and also about training and things like that. But I guess to sort of to sum it up, it comes into, you know, what needs to change? Where does that change needs to need to start? And are there examples of positive change that we can look to as models? So um, whoever would like to start, I know that's a lot, but I'm going to leave it up to y'all. Who wants to chime in first? Uh, Dr. Monroe, you're on the screen, so go ahead. Ms. Garcia, you were going to speak. I, okay. I want to yield my time to, to the, <laughs> thank you. The, the, the dear lady from San Antonio. <laughs> no, thank you. And I, I, I wanted to start because I'm, I know that y'all have, you'd be able to fill in the blanks here. But I think that from my reporting, I, you know, better medical school funding and support for students of color is very important. And I, I don't think that you can expect the larger population um, to you know, to just suddenly start trusting this system, you know, that has been this way all their lives. I think the system needs to, we need to be focusing on how we can um, change that. So um, who's accessing, who's getting into the door at the medical schools and why not, you know? Um, you know, a lot of times folks are, are you know, they're they're following their the footsteps of their parents. And a lot of times those are happen to be affluent white people and um, they have that background, that experience. And a lot of times uh, medical students of color, they're the first in their family to pursue that, you know? Um, and they are looking at debt of $200,000 to become a doctor. I, I mean, there's just, you know, it's, it's, I think that for me, I think that um, that's where it needs to start is really educating and, and getting that pipeline so that there are more doctors of color out there in more communities um, that can be uh, advocates for, for patients. So just real quick, I think I'm gonna underscore uh, strengthening the pipeline, uh, uh, system at creating systems of uh, gap closing the educational opportunities because a big piece of who gets in is how many folks have actually had the, the training, the readiness and investment of 
of a, a educators in a community that says, yes, you can do this work and we're with you and we're behind you. So making sure that we have structures in place to support whatever the educational system is, is how, whatever, however strong it is, we need to have uh, to strengthen our educational system. And in the meantime, before it gets as strong as it needs to be, we need to provide uh, other infrastructure to support learners so we can close the gap with readiness for health professions education as number one. And certainly as it relates to lowering the, the amount of, of, of resources, finding communities that will invest in young people so that they don't have to go into debt to the tune of about $200,000. We also need innovation and commitment within our medical, medical education infrastructure, not just students, but certainly in graduate medical education, but also throughout the continuum of practice. We need to create spaces where great people, uh, I saw that something in the chat about uh, African-American physicians retiring because it's just difficult to manage in this healthcare environment. So, so what are the ways in which we can diversify the workforce, stabilize it so that folks can remain engaged, that they can educate the next generation, not just folks of color, but everybody, because we'll never have enough physicians of color to take care of all the patients. So everybody needs to be engaged, informed, and in general, there is altruism that brings young people into medicine. They want to make a difference from whatever community they've come from, whatever socioeconomic background they come from. In general, when I've interviewed medical, aspiring medical students for uh, the last 20 years, they, a consistent theme is, I want to go back to my community. I want to make a difference in the world. I want to help people. So how do we continue to nurture that desire to help people and make sure that those young people get a deeper understanding of structural factors, they develop structural competency, and they're working not just within healthcare, but frankly, across sectors. So they're working with community agencies, they're working with the communities, they're working with, with uh, uh, Feeding uh, America, they're working with uh, 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 organizations within the community that provide the other, the complementary resources that people need, the safe housing, the food, the employment, the, the, the care, so that what healthcare can do, which is only a piece of the puzzle, that it fits neatly into an institutional and community infrastructure that is better designed to support people's health. Thank you. And, and Dr. Taylor, I'm wondering if you can maybe expand uh, this answer to include all of the sort of the healthcare industry, including whether it's hospitals or insurance or uh, pharmaceutical companies. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think my first recommendation is that we need universal health care. Um, you know, your, your health care, your insurance coverage should not be attached to a job. We've seen that horribly fail us, particularly in the last year with COVID, where millions of Americans have lost their employment, as well as their employer-sponsored health insurance. And so I think that's something we need. Um, I also think that we need to... Um, you know, implement anti-racism training for providers, all personnel in the healthcare system. Um, and we also need to make sure that medical students have it too. But I think the conversation around this really, you know, tends to be laser focused on students, medical students, but it should really, we also need to work with those that are already in the health professions to make sure that they're adequately trained um, in anti-racism. And then I just wanted to lift up a couple of pieces of legislation that I've worked on on the federal level that help to you know, get at the issues around anti-racism. Um, so the first is the COVID-19 Bias and Anti-Racism Training Act, which was introduced actually last year by then Senator Kamala Harris. Um, and that bill really focuses on ensuring anti-racism training for all, um, all the folks that are sort of working in the response to COVID. So everyone from the contact tracers to the vaccinators, um, you know, to, to those um, that are issuing tests. Um, so that's key. Um, and then another piece I wanted to mention is the Anti-Racism and Public Health Act. That is legislation that's been sponsored by um, Senator Elizabeth Warren and Ayanna Presley, both from Massachusetts. And that really focuses on addressing the public health impacts of racism in this country. So everything from higher rates of police violence um, directed towards the black community, as well as addressing the, the health disparities that we've talked about today, you know, higher rates of chronic illness, 
um, lack of access to insurance and some of the other structural issues that we highlighted when it comes to communities of color. Uh, thank you. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, we, we are out of time, but I, I cannot thank you all enough for, for coming uh, on this program today and sharing um, y'all's thoughts, y'all's insights, um, and your inspiration uh, for uh, helping us understand uh, systemic racism in the healthcare industry and, uh, and giving some insight into uh, how we can uh, help uh, stop it. And uh, through that, uh, help uh, the journey towards achieving racial equality and equity. Uh, and I hope that uh, those of you who, who've joined uh, have found this helpful and that you join us on uh, June 2nd uh, when we explore understanding systemic racism in uh, finance, banking, and housing. Uh, I want to thank everyone. Um, this is just uh, the start of uh, our uh, effort to, to better understand uh, and create uh, a place where we can uh, do better and we can work uh, towards achieving these, these goals, uh, which need to happen now and not later. So thank you to our panelists. Thank you all for joining us. Um, and thank you for being a part of the ADL. Have a great afternoon. Good afternoon. Take care. Thank you.